So people ask me, do I think that prices for energy in the United States are going to be lower or higher? I'm reminded of my daughter Teal, the light, or one of the two lights, three lights of my life, wife, older daughter, and younger daughter. To leave out one of the lights would have been a real mistake. Uh, I believe that prices are headed lower in the United States in natural gas and in liquids, not higher. The amount of production that's being brought on is unbelievable. The technology for that production may not be exported to Europe, but it will be exported to Libya and Algeria and Tunisia and South Africa and Madagascar. And it will in some cases be done by American multinationals, but in other cases by people like Tullo Oil and British Petroleum and Shell. And I think that wave of change is in the air. And so you need to bring it into your thinking about how do you manage the world here. The second thing that's clear is this very famous chart, and one that I've studied immensely, uh, the Vattenfall chart. Essentially, how one might be able to reduce the, the uh, carbon emissions and that, in fact, there would be a whole series of things where, which were uh, essentially for free. That if you just did them, the savings would be so clear that people would naturally organize to, to uh, 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 save the emissions. These were typically investments in lighting, investments in energy efficiency, and here, investments in land use. Here, real life subsidies were required to produce things like carbon capture and storage, et cetera. And when I started looking at this, I looked at the Vattenfall chart, I looked at all of these essentially for free savings and emissions, and I said the world is really going to pursue lower energy use rapidly. It's going to happen quickly. It's very, very encouraged. In fact, I think that Everything about this says it's going much, much more slowly than people anticipate. That the changes in human behavior, the changes in company behavior, the changes in international behavior are much more resistant to change than anyone I know of anticipated at the time of the original Vattenfall report. In fact, if you look at where progress has been made, it's nearly only been made as a result of regulation, fuel efficiency, standards imposed by law on the operation of appliances. In the middle, through market making, where essentially rich company, countries have paid poor countries to modify their behavior, by the way, to very limited effect, or through extremely high subsidies. All of these things are political decisions, and the political decisions are viewed as a market failure by one person and as a market choice by another. And at least in America, most of these are seen as market choice rather than market failure, so there's been limited political will to get things done on the regulation side and relatively limited political will to get things on, done on the subsidy side. To speak poorly of, of some, some consequences of all this, in the dialogue between rich countries and poor countries, factories have been built, reported in The Economist and many other places, with purposely high emissions in order to get emission subsidies to run the factories in India and in China. So people have gamed the system, by the way, as people game every system, to take advantage of market making efforts that typically have been underwritten the most by Europeans. America has been a relatively weak player in this game in, turn, in direct terms. Europe has been a relatively large player in this game. But that view of the world that there was some low-hanging fruit that was easy to get simply has not unfolded. And, and I see nothing that's going to change that radically in the short term. Uh, I wish I did, but I just don't. 
And by the way, I could be wrong, but I've now heard in meeting after meeting of people who want it to change that we're at the turn of the corner and somehow the corner keeps moving ahead. By the way, as the prices of conventional energy decrease, the corner keeps moving. Grid parity keeps moving. But the carbon emissions keep going up. Yet, at least in my country, I think it's extremely unlikely that you will see regulation that puts a material cost on carbon. I think in China, it is extremely unlikely you will see regulation that puts a price on carbon. Do I think the Chinese will build a supply chain that says green as green can be to export to Europe? Yes, I do, and I think they have the competence to do it. But that's because the number one priority in China is the number one priority in America, jobs. And if the new regime in China is to believe, it's jobs in the interior, not jobs in the coast. So I think we're playing a high-stake games here that people need to be aware. Because in terms of energy use, the folks who use the energy in the world and are liable to use it for the foreseeable future are you guys, the Americans, the Chinese, and the Indians. And the bulk of the power plants are going to be built by the Chinese and the Indians, and the bulk of the new energy consumption is going to be there. And unless they contain their carbon emissions, no matter how much we might contain our carbon emissions, the planet will get monotonically warmer and unexpected things will happen. Similarly, as a matter of industrial policy, China and to a lesser extent India have now reduced the prices that they charge users for China for energy to the point that anybody who has an industry that is dependent on low cost energy is relocating that industry to that part of the world. That there are two proven ways to reduce carbon emissions. Two proven ways, and only two proven ones at this point in time, of any scale. The first is to substitute natural gas for coal, which the United Kingdom did, and that's what let it get into its Kyoto Protocol, primarily as a result of the windfall in the North Sea. The second way to come in con uh, to get in compliance with the Kyoto Protocols is what the former Soviet Union did. You have an economic collapse. By the way, Germany substituted natural gas for coal in the West and collapsed the economy of East Germany, and that's how they got it done. But if we're not careful in the West, we will deindustrialize in order to meet our carbon targets because we are setting prices that are so high compared to these guys that every business in the ecosystems that depend that business will relocate away from, away from us. Now, I know China wants the jobs. I believe that America needs the jobs or it cannot run its economy. I do not know what the answer to that question is in, in Scotland, much less in Europe. But at the moment, the consequence of our decision is deindustrialization. And I think that's a choice that should be made very, very carefully, because we know that it's extremely difficult to reindustrialize once you put industry's fabric under real pressure. Uh, so where can we look for inspiration? I know that's been an uplifting series of thoughts. I think we can look at inspiration two things. Uh, let me make a point here in case we run out of time. I think a thing that the Europeans need to think about, the UK needs to think about, and Scotland needs to think about very, very soon, are substantial carbon tariffs on imports into the region that put price ceilings in place that will support the renewables decisions you have made. If you don't do that, I think you will de-industrialize big pieces of the economy that you will severely regret over the next 20 or 30 year period of time. And by the way, 
even with that, unless you threw tariff barriers and pressures that are hard and tough, force China and India and America to in fact reduce their carbon emissions, all your effort will be for naught because our atmosphere is a, is a central one and simply moving the source around will not solve the problem. So I think policymakers in Europe in general, in UK is kind of on the swing and all that, need to think about moving very, very, very aggressively on carbon tariffs on imports to avoid this deindustrialization question. But by the way, look at all the trouble people have had putting carbon taxes on aircraft flying into Heathrow. This is no easy feat, but it's quite clear to me what you should do to the US and China here. You should say, you want to play in our game? We're not going to subsidize you to not play the game, which is what you're doing at the moment. So the other place we can look for encouragement is in the venture world. And there's some encouragement there. I would, I would urge you all to go see, go online. I've given an online link here that Andrew will make available to you. Uh, this is Vinod Kozla. Kozla has been able to raise a new venture fund recently of about a billion dollars. Uh, he has had successful economic exits, meaning that he's been able to return money to investors. And he has some products which are economically competitive at scale with conventionals. Uh, in particular, if you look at the flow of venture investing, it's going up and down. It's currently expected to be up this year. I'll come back and report on that. This is now about a year old. But most of the money is not going into new technologies. It's going into financing the ventures that were financed initially as new technologies back in here. Let me say that again, it wasn't very clear. The bulk of the money is going into companies that were launched here and less and less money is going into new ideas. That's not the fault of the money. It's the fault of the new ideas. The alternatives have gotten cheaper. The things that are necessary to show dramatic improvement have in fact not yielded it so investors are not seeing the results to warrant making the investment. We need better ideas. So don't blame the guys who invest the money, blame the entrepreneurs. They've got to come up with better ideas. I wish it was easier. These are the things that are being financed in the U.S. This is a list, I, I happen to have a list of the top 15 later stage financings. And I just want to give you an idea of the companies that have raised the bulk of the new venture capital money in the U.S. And I guess this includes Western Europe, though there's not a Western Europe company here. Uh, an electric vehicle company uh, called Fisker Motors has raised $250 million. By the way, look at this. A drilling information company, a company that helps you figure out how to drill oil wells more effectively, has raised $166 million by the way, from a group of investors that people don't think are clean tech investors. By the way, they think they're clean tech investors. The other clean tech investors say, wait, wait, you don't get to be counted in this. Uh, a company called Sapphire Energy is number five on the list, 140 million. Uh, they make an algae product that has the promise of being competitive, in particular for specialty products. There's a company called Harvest Power, which is very much like some ventures that I've seen here, which take industrial waste and because of local situations and local economics can put an additional step in the manufacturing process and create energy on site on economically favorable terms. Uh, there's a company called Evalence, which is uh, again a science-based company. They've raised 140 million to take natural materials and turn them into specialty chemicals, in, particularly, in particular natural materials which are not necessarily food materials, to make very high value added chemicals. They've raised money. And number 11 on the, on, the, on the list is a company called Bloom Energy, which makes a fuel cell run off of natural gas that produces about half the emissions of even a gas turbine plant 
and power at 11 cents a kilowatt hour. So people with good ideas who can stand the test of economics and can survive in the regulatory environment they're in are in fact raising good pieces of money. In terms of how the companies are doing, a $2 billion IPO has gone to $787 million because this synthetic fuels company has been really hammered as expectations of future oil prices have dropped. On the other hand, in California, Elon Musk's, the guy who has, has uh, launched space vehicles, etc., has just brought out a company with a market cap of $1.1 billion that finances rooftop solar because the state of California is in fact going to subsidize people to use solar. If I took a bunch of people from Northern California, not Southern California, and I threw them in this room, they would talk like you, they would think like you, they would be you. And they've got the political support in the state of California to continue these policies. The only problem that the state of California has got is that their financial condition is about the same as Italy. Can they afford their ambition? And then they're, they're in the act of working that out at the moment. But there's the political support. You literally would think you were, they don't do offshore wind, they do something else, but they, they, they're into to paying for this. In terms of the effect on the venture business, uh, it's, it has in fact not gone up as anticipated. It is shrinking rapidly at this point in time. So new money is not flowing into the new venture area in clean tech at all. And it's not flowing in because the money doesn't want to go there. It's flowing in because the alternatives have gotten more severe and it's tougher to make business propositions that make economic sense on a, on a broad scale. So if we look at that, what's the consequence? Fossil fuel usage around the world is escalating rapidly. The shale gas bonanza in the United States has dumped cheap coal into Europe. Otherwise, by the way, the coal yards of U.S. utilities would be overflowing, and they've got take-or-pay contracts so the coal companies have made good money. In fact, some of the utilities have made good money selling the coal at a premium to you in Europe. The Germans have helped this, of course, by shutting down their nuclear plants. So coal use is escalating, and I think this is in The Economist uh, within the past week or two, at a rate that I certainly did not anticipate. I never thought that could be true. So when we think about all that, does that mean we are doomed? Again, I always look to the cartoons when I want inspiration. This cartoon appears about every six or seven years in a magazine called The New Yorker, where everybody's locked on to some view of the past. They know the view of the past is changed, but they don't want to change. And like lemmings, they prepare to march over the cliff. I think there's been enough change in this world that we need to decide whether we want to be a lemming or not. And by the way, it doesn't make that much difference whether you're an investor lemming or a wealthy banker if you go over the edge. So let's look for some opportunity. Tonight, one billion people in the world will go to sleep in the dark. That's a huge opportunity. By the way, they pay a fortune for light. They pay a fortune for water. They pay a fortune to stay warm. They're literally willing to pay a tremendous amount of money if we can figure out how to deliver and finance the service to them. So unlike American consumers who won't pay a farthing, or European consumers who, who have not really seen the prices begin to hit until quite recently, there are a bunch of customers out there that we ought to think about serving. The National Academies in the United States tried to pick the number one invention of the 20th century. And the thing they picked is electricity. 
the biggest single thing that changed human endeavor, electricity. And by the way, if you survey well-being as represented by the voters of places, or by the citizens, it's highly correlated with electricity use. The better off people are, the more electricity they use. Their children are healthier, they live longer, they learn better, they don't revolt the same way. Electricity changes the world. And we ought to think about changing it for those billion people that go to sleep in the night. The other thing we ought to do, though, is we ought to look to see if we can change electricity for us. The overwhelming emitters of carbon in the world are the U.S., soon China, soon India, and Europe, including Russia. We're the bad guys. And some people have begun to put new alternatives on the table that we all ought to think about. In particular, I would urge you to go to the TED Talks and watch, which we will tomorrow in class, we don't have time tonight, Bill Gates talk about his new project, TerraPower, which is a new generation of nuclear power plants that have the promise to produce zero emissions, the promise to produce energy at the price of coal, that face huge technological uncertainty, but by the way, are being financed so far without a single government dollar, but by a group of venture capitalists, by Bill Gates, by Vinod Kosla, by Reliance Electric, and are beginning to appear on the table. I knew nothing about this until I ran into this group of people uh, making a presentation in China. There's a whole new generation of nuclear power plants that don't count on producing long-lived waste. The nuclear equation can be changed such that you don't have waste for tens of thousands of years. You've got waste for hundreds of years, but not thousands of years, where engineers can probably sequester them and store them. And by the way, if you do that, you can supply, if you can solve that problem, and, and I urge you to go to TED to, to listen to Bill, you could supply U.S. levels of energy to 9 billion people for 1,000 years. U.S. levels of energy to 9 billion people for 1,000 years. Are there unsolved problems? Yes, there are. But if you solve that problem, you've solved a problem that changes the game. The thing that surprised me as I looked into this is this list, and it's in a case I've written about TerraPower. And again, uh, I discovered by chance I am a TerraPower investor, by the way. I didn't know. That's because I own an incredibly little piece of this company. <laughs> by the way, by mistake. But as I looked into it, around the world, there are probably 20 or 30 different teams of people coming up with inventions here. My favorites are a company called Martingale, three guys with a new way to produce uh, power from thorium instead of uranium, using molten salt instead of light water reactors, uh, producing reactors that if they fail, freeze passively and don't require active intervention. Uh, by the way, I found another company called TriAlpha, run by an 89-year-old entrepreneur who've raised $250 million, who's got an energy-positive fusion reaction nine miles from Lawrence Livermore in Northern California, funded by a group of wealthy venture capitalists. There, and, and why does that matter? Why am I telling you about it? Well, you can read The Scotsman. Literally, people could leave this room tonight. They could take one of these companies and they could build that reactor here if they chose to. Why? These are new ideas with small companies where small amounts of money can make progress. 
Two, the reason that these reactors are not getting built is policies and regulations, not physics and science. It's that people won't give licenses to build new technology because after Three Mile Island and following Chernobyl, we decided to make it absolutely certain that energy could be safe. And we've made it safe by eliminating any possibility of innovation. And we're going to pay that price with carbon emissions. So the precautionary principle is taken to an extreme. So what if I would urge you to do, look for your own black swans. I'm looking at new nuclear now. I'm looking at carbon capture. I'm looking at how human behavior can be changed and how that can affect energy use. Not only efficiency, but redesign of how people live basis. But there are other changes that are possible in biofuels, in batteries, in microgrids, in carbon trade tariffs. Again, if I were you, I would look seriously at accelerated programs of carbon tariffs to protect your renewables business, at least it be destroyed by the dash for gas. Uh, I think you need to accept the fact that around the world, industrial policy is allowing people to construct cartels. So free markets are in fact a thing that are going to be in jeopardy here. And that's neither good nor bad, but you better know which side of the game you're in. Uh, and there may be totally unknown things that you should look at. In any event, we're spinning a roulette wheel. You need to come up with your own opinions about the odds and the outcomes. The people that give me the most guidance here are Scott, Adam Smith, and the power of the invisible hand. Look at how quickly that shale gas has moved as price signals have let markets come to bear. By an Englishman, uh, David Ricardo, who established that in industries that had competitive, comparative advantage could dominate their markets without mercantilism, without government intervention, if they were really good, but they required government intervention and government support in order to have a chance to get into that position. And at least in America, a Scotsman and an Englishman have always been good people to go to to get advice. For Scotsmen and Englishmen, I'd also take advice from an Austrian, a man named Schumpeter, who invented the phrase creative destruction and pointed out that entrepreneurs create the new organizations that destroy the status quo and bring forward the future. So I would take what you've got and I would add to it an entrepreneurial zeal and that entrepreneurial zeal, I think, is what will solve this problem. And that's the relentless pursuit of opportunity beyond the constraints of the resources currently involved. So I urge Scotland not only to work on renewables, but to advance and exploit the knowledge it has in conventional oil and gas that was forged off Aberdeen over many, many years with many companies and forged in the North Sea. Get into the generation of new nuclear you have the advantage of kind of being a nation. You can make a lot of your own rules here. And it is an open field. By the way, as open as fracking was seven, ten years ago. There are a thousand choices in front of you. So don't abandon renewables, but for God's sakes, protect them while you get other things going. We need a safer world, a secure world, a more prosperous world, and that requires us all to be real about the world we're in. In the end, I don't think we should be lemmings that go over the edge. I think we should be lemmings that fly. And those are people that exploit the great natural resources that are available to them. And the greatest natural resource available to Scotland is Scots. Thank you very much.